All right, what's going on, you guys? Nick here with Nick Strength and Power. I've got a couple of interesting stories for you guys today. The first story that I've got for you guys today, the latest training video and kind of a physique update from Dexter Jackson, who recently retired. As of the 2020 Mr. Olympia, he's currently 52. And the reason why I wanted to show this training video is I think Dexter is kind of a trailblazer um, for what life looks like post-professional bodybuilding into his 50s. Because while Dexter is clearly downsized comparatively to how he looked as a competitive pro, he still looks fantastic. He still looks like a bodybuilder, and that could be a combination of genetics and you know the past 30 years of training, being able to retain a pretty significant amount of muscle. But you know, you look at some of these guys that we talk about in their mid 40s, late 40s, even some in their early 40s that might be getting to the end of their competitive prime. Maybe their placings are start to decrease um, and you're seeing them get older and you think, you know, when is it time to retire and what does that retirement look like and how much of a factor does ego play into potentially not wanting to retire? Because with retirement also comes, you know, the pressure to still look good, still look like a bodybuilder, even though there's not really much reason to because you're not competing in retirement. And Dexter, I think, is a perfect example in his 50s still looking fantastic, but being a lot healthier, being a lot smaller, significantly downsized, but looks good. I think Jay Cutler is another good example, even though he's much deeper into his quote unquote retirement than Dexter is. But again, I just think Dexter is a good example of what your physique could look like to a lot of these pro bodybuilders that might be on the tail end of their career. You can still look good. You don't necessarily have to walk around and maintain this big unhealthy physique, you can look like Dexter and be a lot healthier than you would be walking around in the upper 200s. I'm sure Dexter is much closer to 200 pounds than he is to 300 pounds. So shout out to Dexter Jackson, man. Another guy that's kind of an example of this is Juan Morrell. Now, Juan has been inactive as a competitive bodybuilder for about the same time as Dexter has. His last Olympia, and I think the last time we saw him on stage, was that 2020 Mr. Olympia where he took 16th. Now, he shared a current downsize physique update where he says he's weighing 240 pounds, and he says this is the lightest he's been in a very, very long time. And look, he still looks great by almost any standard outside of being a competitive pro bodybuilder. He still looks good. He still looks muscular. He's running a business, the My Cookie Dealer business. Um, he doesn't necessarily need to walk around looking like a massive bodybuilder, and he knows that. Just put up this side-by-side -side of his physique now compared to his physique when he was competitive, and you look at how crazy big, crazy vascular, really a, a freaky physique that Juan had. That physique got him 16th place at the Olympia. His physique now is getting him probably millions of dollars running this business that he's running. He's doing very well financially now with very little obligation from his actual physique, whereas that 16th place at the Olympia was probably getting him almost nothing because it certainly wasn't getting him prize money, but it might have been getting him maybe some sponsorship money. So again, just an example of weighing out the risks and rewards later on in your career when your placings are dropping, you're aging up, um, you know, of downsizing and maybe not maintaining that big physique anymore. Maybe it's not worth it. Now, let's kind of flip this around here. We're talking about bodybuilders towards the end of their career, older in age. Let's talk about bodybuilders younger in age at the beginning of their career, because this has been a big topic lately. Um, the NPC recently announced a really big news change or rule change, I should say about the age at which you can begin competing. So the new rule says you must be 18 years old and over to compete in any NPC competition. The new NPC teenage division is really going to be only 18 and 19 because it's a teenage division. Male and female eligibility, you must have reached your 18th birthday on or before the date of the event and have not reached your 20th birthday to compete in any NPC teenage category event. All teens under the age of 18 are not allowed to compete in any NPC event. This ruling comes directly from the NPC national offices and is effective immediately. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the minimum age for the teenage category before was 13. So this, effect this effectively wipes out five years um, of teenage bodybuilding eligibility to compete. And I think it's kind of unfortunate. I mean, teenage bodybuilding is a big part of the industry, um, whether you see a lot of it or not. You know, when I was in high school, there was a lot of people that competed as teens. A lot of people right now in high school want to compete as teens, especially with social media. A lot of people are getting into bodybuilding, fitness, working out younger and younger because they're seeing it younger and younger on social media. So teenage bodybuilding is a huge, huge part of the business. And I would imagine financially, there's probably a big incentive to keep those teenage divisions around. So 
there must be a good reason or a big reason why they're dropping it. I doubt that it's just for no reason. They don't really specify why here. But if I had to speculate, I would imagine it has something to do with liability um, of having kids competing that are not adults. Maybe some angry parents. Because certainly, while I would imagine the majority of teenagers competing are not on gear and are probably natural and are probably just beginners into their lifting journey, and I think they should have that division whether you're 13, 14, 15, if you want to start competing, I think that should exist. And I don't really like this rule change. There probably are a lot of teenagers that are competing in those teen divisions under 18 or were that were taking gear and maybe their parents found out and weren't happy about it. I could imagine it might have been a liability situation like that because like I said, I think there's a large amount of teenagers that want to compete and were competing under 18 so financially, that's good for the business. The NPC and IFBB is a business. So for them to take it away, like I said, I would think there would have to be some kind of catalyst or some kind of reason other than just you know a random um, and seemingly kind of arbitrary rule change to 18 because it effectively wipes out that entire teenage division um, and might be the end of teenage bodybuilding, which I, again, I think is important. A lot of pros today, a lot of the best legends in bodybuilding started out their bodybuilding careers competing as teens, not 18, 19. You saw a lot of people competing at really young ages that are legends now. So the other side of that is how many people become interested in bodybuilding at 13, 14, 15, 16, or 17 that might have been interested in competing and they realize they're not able to until they're 18. They don't bother waiting around until they're 18. They just say, eh, I'll move on to something else and never get into bodybuilding because a lot of people first get interested at those young ages. So how many people might pass up on competing because now they've got to wait to 18, I guess would be the other side of that. Guys with a lot of potential might pass on bodybuilding entirely because it's not an option for them until they're 18 and they just don't want to wait. I mean, when you're 13, 14, 18 and 19 seems like an eternity away in the future. So maybe not a lot of people would start training at 13 um, to one day compete at 18. If you don't have the outlet to compete immediately at 13, 14 or whatever, maybe you just don't train and compete at all. So I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts on this. I think it's a little bit of a controversial decision. You know, what do you think the pros and cons are of this? And what do you think the reason might have been for them, you know, handing down this ruling? Now, the next story here, this is a powerlifting story also kind of relating to a rule change. The USPA new rule set bans trans athlete Angel Flores from competing at a drug-tested competition. So this has received a little bit of backlash and has been kind of a controversial decision, and I don't think it should be. I think this is pretty cut and dry that this is, you know, this 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 is what it should be. This is a tested competition. This is not an open competition for untested athletes. This does not even include older athletes that might even be on TRT. They specifically say this includes trans athletes and people with other medical conditions that require hormonal treatment. So that would include TRT. So this is pure tested competition. So in her Instagram post, Angel breaks down the things specifically that she had a problem with. Rule one, transgender athletes will only be allowed to compete in untested divisions. And rule two, all prescribed hormones are banned from tested divisions. No medical exemptions will be given, which I think is how it should be. And I think that includes TRT. Older lifters on TRT, I think they have an edge over regular lifters, whether in their age category or not, that are not on TRT. So I think they should compete in the untested category. So a lot of times this debate with trans people and powerlifting is about can a trans woman compete in a woman's division? Can a trans male compete in a male division? But more often it's the trans woman competing in a woman's division. That's usually what the debate is. This is not the same debate here. They're saying you can compete just in an untested division. She can still compete with women is what I'm gathering from this, but it has to be in an untested division. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this one too. Me personally, I don't disagree with this rule. If you're on any type of hormone therapy and they've got a tested division, you can't compete in that tested division, but you can still compete in untested. I just want to reiterate that. They're not saying trans people cannot compete. And look, from my perspective, if I were an older guy and I were on TRT or, or I needed to be on hormone replacement for whatever reason, I wouldn't want to compete against people who are not on TRT because I don't think it would be fair for me who is on TRT using those hormones to gain an edge that I otherwise would not have. I wouldn't want to compete in a tested competition where other people are not using hormones to gain an edge that they 
otherwise would not have. It's a tested competition, so I wouldn't do that personally, especially when the untested division exists for that purpose, for those people. So again, just to be clear, I do think she should be allowed to compete, but in an untested division. I think if they are going to create a tested category where they're going to prevent, for example, men on TRT from competing, the only real rule that would be fair would be to ban anybody on any hormones at all from competing in that tested category. I think that is the fairest way to have a tested division. And the final story that we've got for you guys today, Breon Ainsley, four weeks out from the Arnold Classic. He is a former Arnold Classic champion. He's a former Olympia champion. He's got to be on paper, one of the favorites going into this show, to try to beat Rough Diesel and take the crown from Terrence, who won the 2020 Arnold Classic. But Terrence had recently beaten Breon at the Olympia. And again, my prediction is that Terrence will win the Arnold again. And I think maybe Ramon Dino is going to give Urs Kalsinski and Breon Ainsley, the two guys that were ahead of him at the Olympia, the biggest run for their money if he comes correct here. But Breon in these updates has been looking really, really impressive. And I don't think Breon will be any lower than top three at the Arnold. But I think kind of the fact of the matter is every year at the Olympia, Breon looks impressive leading up to the show, especially the past couple of years. He posts some really impressive updates at several weeks out from the show. But then the show comes around and he's still thir he was still third the past two years. So the question really is, does it matter how good Breon looks in these updates under the goon light? If looking good in the updates hasn't translated over to a victory for him in the past couple of years. I also think it's interesting too how Breon used to be one of the bigger proponents of the vacuum pose not being necessary or really important in classic physique. And now I feel like every update he posts, he's hitting the vacuum pose. So maybe he is you know, change teams. Now he sees the importance. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. That's going to wrap it up for the video today, guys. I hope you did, in fact, enjoy it. Please give it a thumbs up if you did. Please make sure you subscribe. If you have not subscribed already, click that bell notification icon. As always, I love you guys. Appreciate you guys. Nick Strength and Power signing out.